so two points, and one is I'll address uh, uh, Vince's uh, uh, second point. The first is with regard to the difference. Okay, yeah. Much like civilian courts, we have a track record with this microphone <laughs> as opposed to this one, which is in fact my first point. Um, uh, the discussion here reminds me of what Churchill's, Churchill's old line about democracy. It's a terrible system except for all the others. You know, we have, as Jim points out and points out eloquently in his report, not only do we have the rich experience of civilian criminal courts, federal civilian criminal reports, but we have a rich experience, sadly, in exactly this area with regard to Islamic extremist terrorists. And he has set out, just giving you kind of a very, you know, tip of the iceberg um, uh, account of how well that has worked. And as I say, you know, I put the burden on those who would depart from our most fundamental traditions of fairness and justice. Um, and uh, so far, this system has worked without producing any of the parade of horribles that we've had uh, listed here. Um, moreover, when it comes to what other countries do, what other countries do, I can't speak to France per se, but I can speak to about 30 other countries where I know something about how they deal with terrorists, um, about a dozen of which I've been to. They do it through civilian courts. Now, they don't do it through the same civilian courts as what the Irish call ordinary decent criminals. Um, but they are, at the end of the day, civilian courts. They are not military courts. The United States is distinctive in using a military, or at least um, uh, uh, talking about a military option in this regard. What most other countries do is precisely use a civilian court, um, which, you know, and it has worked to varying degrees. Now, when it comes to, you know, by contrast, Whereas we have a rich experience with civilian courts, military commissions we have almost no experience with in any context. Military commissions, by definition, are unusual and to be used in only the most extreme and exigent circumstances. Military courts are courts martial. Okay? The Uniform Code of Military Justice barely mentions military commissions and does not clearly authorize them in its text. The Supreme Court is so construed it in a very problematic uh, you know, World War II case as party queer. So we have very little experience on the ground with military commissions at all, much less in this setting. And indeed, if you want to see litigation go on and on and on, try it in an unproven, brand new, highly unusual court system, which the Supreme Court has already expressed some skepticism about. And you know, I cannot wait to see what the constitutional challenges are going to be to military commissions, even as uh, written by the Obama administration. And then there's the little problem of our compliance, both with the UCM, through the UCMJ domestically and internationally with the Geneva Conventions. Because the Geneva Conventions in, in a, a common article three, which the Supreme Court has held, applies to exactly this sort of situation, has said that the courts must recognize the fundamental procedural safeguards deemed essential by civilized nations. So if you want to get into a thicket of problems and prolonged litigation and unknown horribles, try the military commission system. Point one, point two, more quickly, is how this is going to play. Well, again, you know, I've been in many countries, and I have some sense of how this is going to go. I'll tell a quick story. Right after 9-11, the first human rights mission that the Crowley program did was to Malaysia, which has a preventative detention statute. It's a Muslim country, moderate Muslim country, with extreme, you know, uh, worried about an extreme uh, Muslim movement. Now, what were we greeted with there? You know, we were trying to say preventative detention is not good, it doesn't comport with international standards, you know, the U.S., you know, uh, uh, doesn't do it, etc. They're saying, oh, you passed the Patriot Act, and that's just like our thing. Well, the Patriot Act was nowhere near as bad as what they did, but that was the perception. And so the perception of a military court of any sort around the world, I can tell you from first-hand experience, is going to be twofold. Repressive regimes like China are going to use it, and Malaysia and others are going to use it against political opposition, religious opposition, against uh, um, uh, minorities who are unpopular. And those in the moderate Muslim world who are you know, on the fence, who are, you know, might be won over by the United States example, you know, not everyone in the Muslim world is a hard-nosed you know, hard Al-Qaeda operative. You know, they are going to see it the same way. 
that this is, you know, that the United States is full of so much hot air when it comes to the rule of law. And, um, and as I say, much like many other executive overreactions to terrorism throughout the world, will be counterproductive rather than productive. First, um, one problem that it's actually a conundrum that the administration currently faces, of course, is that they're doing both. They're putting people through military commissions and through civilian trials. So all of the problems that Professor Flaherty just mentioned um, that are attendant to military commissions, we're going to have anyway. Why would we take on both when we don't need to, especially given the enormous difficulties, practical and otherwise, that we'll face in the civilian uh, court context. Of course, the federal courts have experience with federal uh, with terrorism cases, uh, and broad experience. There's no question about that. And of course, uh, many cases have been successfully prosecuted, and legitimately so. None of them are easy, that the records show. Um, but these cases are different. This is unique. There aren't instances of trying people whom we've held as unlawful enemy combatants, detainees, for years upon years after interrogating them over and over again against their will, including with respect to some of them using physical force to overcome their resistance to talking. This has not happened. This is a new thing. And it is a very, very significant challenge. Last point. What if the United States loses? Or what if the jury hangs? Both possible. The very protections we provide, proof beyond a reasonable doubt on every element of the offense, etc., makes it hard to convict people. And what if, what if it happens? What, is, what, is the, uh, what has the President or the Attorney General said about that? Well, we'll continue to hold KSM anyway until the end of the conflict, as, it's, as is our right to do. My reaction to that is, I guess, twofold. It's hard to see us gaining a lot of legitimacy worldwide from that state of affairs. And second, I got to think that the federal courts might well bristle at the notion that the executive branch has announced ahead of time that it doesn't care what the outcome of the case is. The prisoner will continue to be held. Now. The legal basis for holding the prisoner after the detainee, excuse me, after an acquittal or a hung jury, um, you know, if, if the prosecution of the learner goes forward, will be different from the legal basis that would be attendant to holding him after a conviction. There's no question about that. So I don't think it's strictly a Habermas case <coughs> problem where there, where there isn't Article III power because the executive can revise the judgment. But if I'm a, I'm a federal court, I'm wondering, well, if the government has already announced that this isn't going to make any practical difference. Why are we doing this? Which, which in, in, it, it goes to a larger point, which is, again, since we're doing commissions anyway, I've yet to see the distinction between those detainees that the Attorney General has assigned to military commissions and those whom he has assigned to civilian court. Why are we doing it? It's not worth it. Well, I have to say, I was as I had a lot of fun preparing for this, and had, have had even more fun um, participating in it. If I, the one thing I really am surprised by was to have the French system cited as, <laughs> as the model that we should all aspire to. Uh, that's a, that's that's kind of funny. Um, um, so, just a couple thoughts. Um, Again, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the time limitations that we have here today really, unfortunately, uh, are just don't afford the chance to really have a, an in-depth, thorough discussion about all the issues that have been raised. Um, and if, if, if people are interested, um, I would recommend, you know, the, the, these reports and there's other, uh, a lot of other uh, great uh, research that's been done that really goes into a lot of detail. Um, just a couple thoughts um, in response to what uh, some of the other panelists have said. You know, is this is this case? You know, assuming it happens, is it going to be you know 
probably one of the biggest trials ever. Yeah, is it going to present you know incredible challenges? Yes, but again, is it completely unprecedented? No. And I mean, we did try Jose Padilla, who was held as an enemy combatant for years, who was subject to interrogation, and there's a you know it worked. Um, Al Mari, same situation, was transferred into the civilian justice system and pled guilty. Um, so Guy Lani who is, you know, right now um, a defendant before Judge Kaplan, one of the embassy bombers um, who was captured uh, uh, overseas, held in Guantanamo, um, brought here back in the, in the fall, um, that prosecution is going forward. So, you know, I, I think it's, there's a real risk of overstatement by casting this as something that no one's ever seen before and we can't deal with.